Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I studied graphic design at university and I majored in multimedia. Um, and majority of my career I've been a web designer. But over the last, I'd say, five years is the work I'm mainly, mainly known for. Um, and that's been as an illustrator in pop culture. Um, and let's see, here we go. And, and this is the work I've produced over the last few years. I've been really lucky to work with like, some great properties and some great clients. Um, but when I started that transition from being a web designer to an illustrator, it wasn't something, it wasn't a uh, cognitive you know, career choice. I wasn't meaning to do this. Um, it came quite organically to me. So let's go back a few years. So this is kind of where I started. So if, even if you go on my Instagram today, these, these posts still exist. Um, so this is going back about, I'd say, six years. Um, I loved my day job, I was a designer, and I was really fortunate to be able to do what I did, um, but I wanted to do something outside of that space, and I wanted to do something for myself. Um, and I just, I picked up illustration again, and it wasn't something I'd really done since childhood or, for, or from college or high school, um, so I was kind of learning that, that process again. So I'd draw on anything and everything, and, you know, and it was just that process of, okay, let's put pen to paper again, and let's, let's draw and have fun doing that. So it would be anything from post-it notes, um, drawing on my lunch, to drawing on my phone while I was on the train. And it was just about enjoying the process. There wasn't, there wasn't a brief involved, there wasn't a client involved. I was doing everything for myself and just enjoying the full process. Um, and I carried on doing this for about a year. And it's like, at that point, I was having a lot of fun. But I thought, OK, the designer in me wants to set myself a project, set myself a brief. So the first thing I did, though, what do I love apart from, you know, from design and so forth? And it was cinema. So I said, let's, let's design some movie posters. And these are the first posters I, I designed in that period. So this is, I'd say, 2013. Um, I guess this is generally like the height of the minimalist poster movement when everyone was like really enthusiastic about that. So these are the first things I did. Um, I'm looking back at these and, you know, from where, where I am today, I feel like these are quite crude in what they are. But what I still like about them is like there's a clear concept, an idea behind the piece, you know, with involving the quote from the movie, um, some strong imagery from the movie with the title. There, there's, I'm trying to tell a narrative there. Um, and I was really pleased with them at the time, and it's like, I, I got quite a lot of a buzz from that, and from that buzz, it's like, okay, let's carry on on this, this journey, and let's try and get better at, you know, designing posters. Um, so then, like, you know, hopefully I started getting a little bit better. I started putting a bit more time into my work and trying to get my execution a little bit better, and I, I followed on doing this for the next, I guess, year, and th these are the pieces I'd done during that, that period. Um, so the work was getting better, um, and I started sharing my work online, and websites started picking that work up and started reblogging it and resharing it. And you know, that was probably the exciting thing at the time, because these were blogs that I would read on my lunch period, and they were design blogs, and they were started sharing my work. You know, it was amazing, and I was like, still to those days, those, those, those posts are on my Instagram, because kind of it's where I've started off, and it's like, I'm very proud of that. You know, you can, you can map my entire journey via my Instagram from that point of view. So, at this point, I was like, great, you know, get, getting, getting accolades and so forth, people are resharing my work, let's try and do a bit more with this. So this round about this time, after sharing my work and for about a year or so, um, I got a call from a, a movie exec in the States, and it was an email, and I, like, the first thing I thought was, okay, this has got to be some prank, no ways, you know, some from, someone from LA calling me. Um, so I, I jumped onto LinkedIn to see if the person was who actually they were, and they were. So I was like, great, okay, this is real. Um, so over about a two-week period, there was like a conversation, like there's a, there's a new film coming out, we'd love you to do an alternative poster for it. And it's like, you want an official poster of me, but it's an alternative. And it's like, oh, yeah, great. Um, so we spoke for about two weeks, and this is the first official poster I ever designed. Um, it's for the movie Spring Breakers. Um, and I look back at it now, and it's like, okay, you know, the, the way I was drawing back then is very vector-based vector and so on. But it was like, I really enjoyed the idea of the piece and the subtlety of it. Um, and it's like, it, it got put on I, IMDb, and my name was being used. And I was like, in the office the next day, like, to my manager, go, hey, this is what I've done. He's like, what are you doing here, doing web design, when you can be doing stuff like this? I go, I enjoy doing both, to be honest. It's like having that yin and the yang between your day job and having something outside of that. Yeah, it really worked well for me. So I was like, great. But yeah, still carrying on doing the normal sort of thing every day. Um, so that's, that's really where I started. Um, over the, I'd say, the last five years, it's like I've, I've, I think this talk has kind of like spotlighted it for me, looking back on my work. Because you never look back at your work that, that 
in detail. It's like you're always looking forward. You're always looking at the, the piece you're currently working on and the next piece after that. So having to have to look back at my work, it's like, where can I, has my journey flowed through this? And it's, it's really been about execution. How do I keep my work interesting? Because I always want to draw better than I did yesterday. I always want to be, you know, getting my skills to that level where I'm happy with what I'm doing and I'm always seeing, you know, progress. Um, being the self-taught self -taught illustrator, it's been quite an important thing to me, like getting my work up to the point where I'm proud of it. Um, so what we're going to go over now is kind of that, that journey I went through from all the way from 2018 and, and just talking about execution and how it's developed. So this is, this is, this is 2013. This, this is what I was producing in 2013. Um, so looking back at it, it's, it's very much vector-based. There's, there's levels of texture and tone being used. And the reason why there's texture and tone is because I wanted my work to feel organic. I wanted it to feel like traditional art, like I'm using brush strokes and stuff like, even though at that point I know I, I couldn't draw as well or paint as, as I wanted to. So I used to draw vector shapes and try and use texture and tone just to fill those out so they're not just flat representations. Um, and this is pretty much a snapshot of the work I produced during that, like I'd say that first year where I was solidly just designing movie posters. Um, still very happy with a lot of, lot of things I'm doing because the, the ideas are still like at the core of the piece. But yeah, from an execution point of view, uh, I'd love to at some point go back to a lot of my old work and then just reinterpret that again. So going forward another year, this is 2014. Um, 2014, so I've, I've taken what I've learned in 2013 and I'm, I'm now drawing, I'm still working with shapes and stuff, but I'm using more complex shapes and I'm using a lot more texture and tone and shading to try and fill those rather than just, just flat, flat sort of gradient maps. Um, if you can see on um, the Dragon Ball Z piece, there's, there's lots of like little scratches and embellishes on the Dragon Ball just to try and add that realism to the piece. So I'm getting a bit more confident in my stroke work and I'm not just relying on, I'd say, gradient maps and things like that. During that year, I, I got commissioned by Shortlist Magazine to create an alternative poster for Planet of the Apes. Um, and if you look back, look at the piece, it's like it's still the background, still very much based on, on vector art. You know, it's still solid shapes using um, texture and tone. But um, for for Caesar, it's like there's no way I'm just going to be able to do that work via gradients. So okay, we're going to be using um, brushwork to you know, create create the hair, create the body, create everything else there. So I mean, looking back at it, it's like I, I should have used a lot smaller brush to create that. But still, it was my first foray into kind of actually physically drawing and painting an entire piece. Um, so I'm really proud of it from that point of view because it is a kind of a milestone for me. Um, but one of the things I learned during this process and drawing that figure was attention to detail. Um, and it's one of the things like a lot of people look at a digital artist and they think because you're a digital artist, the computer does half the work for you. And it's like it's not really the, really the case because you, you're still there, you're still drawing every single stroke by hand and that's the way I've tried to carry on doing my piece. I want to produce the work as I, were, as I would be if I was doing it in traditional medium. Um, so one of the processes I did for creating this piece, um, if you see the detail, every single hair that's drawn on Caesar's body is hand drawn. Every single hair is a stroke by me. And that was a really important thing for me, that little journey of like, I want to make sure everything I put on that piece of paper is not because I press fill in Photoshop, not because I just threw a gradient map over something. I wanted it to count and every pixel to count and it to be as organic as possible. So I spent like a whole evening going around the entire silhouette and drawing every single hair from every like thick hair to every thin hair. And it's like, it's very therapeutic, I'll tell you that, just doing something like that. But it just, it, it adds a level of honesty in your work. So what you see is exactly what the artist drew. And there's not, you can't really hide behind anything there. And it's a great exercise in actually, you know, penmanship and having different strokes and using sensitivity of, sensitivity of your stroke to create, you know, depth. 2015, so 2015, carrying on from all the lessons I learned in 2014, um, this is the work I started producing in 2015. Um, both of these were official pieces. One was for Fantastic Four, um, crazy film that came out. Um, I still love, still love the, work, the, the poster, but the film was crazy with what got released. But it's a great anecdote because there's so much you know, like weird stuff that went on behind the scenes behind that film. I remember 
it was a week before the poster was going to release and the film was going to release and they changed the whole colour tone of some of the special effects. So all the green cracks that are actually in the rocks there, they were originally orange and we only got the, um, the memo a week before it went out. So it's like, what's going on with this film? And it's like, okay, when it finally got released, you understood what was actually happening behind closed doors. Um, but with this work, it was like, I'm using a lot more brush strokes during this period. I'm, I'm a lot more confident in, in in, in, my, in my work and in, in my ability to draw a bit more and paint a bit more with my strokes. So as you can see, it's like, I'm still using in a sense like blocks and shapes and stuff, but you know, there's, the, there's a lot more freedom in my strokes going on. So during this period, the other thing that, that I came across was screen printing. And it's like, wow, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm limited to a select color palette and the way you layer ink and you layer stuff, it's, it's totally different from creating, say, a painting in the normal sense. But it's something I was really interested in. And this is the, like, the first kind of like, I guess, example to kind of like in, you know, my, my first foray into trying to do a screen print. I mean, this is, this is not a finished piece by any means. It's sometimes something I drop back into to play around with. But you can actually see from the top corner, that's the color palette I'm working on. I'm working on a black piece of paper and I'm, and I'm using um, four colors to paint the entire scene. And it's that, that process of layering ink between going from light, from going from light to darkest to create tone, texture, um, and just creating a, a bigger scene than I was normally used to. So I was like, okay, we've, we've drawn stuff, we've drawn stuff that we're concentrating on one image and one person. Let's try and expand that universe a bit more and expand, expand my canvas to try and encapsulate a bit more detail and a bit more storytelling within that. 2016. Uh, so 2016, I'm still, I'm still holding down my day job. I'm still drawing after work and on weekends. I'm trying to balance the two. Um, but 2016 was like a point where I was like, okay, I generally take about a day to day and a half when you chop it up between weekends and evenings to produce a piece. And I was like, what if I, if rather than just spending that amount of time, what if I double that amount of time or triple that amount of time on a piece? Rather than spending a day and a half, let's spend three days. Let's spend a week on one piece and really, really like you know, put some extra effort into it. So these are like the first pieces towards the beginning of that year. Um, the um, Batman v Superman piece is one of my favorites just because it features my son in, in the main pose. Um, but it was that thing of okay, let's really take our time and like draw, you know, draw everything and take our time drawing everything. And so from a detail point of view, it was like I was really happy at the time just like to produce something with that shows that much work on a piece of paper to show that detail, to show the anatomy of a person and have it quite, quite accurate. Um, so very pleased. And even with the Stranger Things piece, it's like everything, drawing, drawing the hands and trying to get that level of distance within the piece and just the little flecks of light and everything going around. It's like, let's, let's take a bit more time doing what you're doing because it's like, I need to show, um, I've got a great idea, but let's, let's show some execution on the page at the same time. So these are two pieces I also did that year. So these both official pieces. One was for Assassin's Creed and one was for Planet Earth 2. Um, and they, they're basically like polar ends of, of what I was doing that year. Um, so the first piece was, was my first time of like trying to paint and trying to paint in the medium which is a bit more um, reminiscent of oil paint. So the, the brief was, can we have a Renaissance style painting done? So it's great, I haven't painted yet, but let's, like, let's give it a go. Um, so that was the first thing I produced. So I was like researching the art of the period and looking at what are the, what are the color tones, what are like the pigments that people use from the time and how, what are the strokes like. So hence why we've got something with these like these great like brownie golds because that was, that was the, the paints that were available at the time. Having, having pigments which were bright blues, bright reds, they weren't used as much because the paint was so expensive. So it was nice to do that, that bit of research and so it kind of built itself into my piece. Um, the second piece, which was for Planet Earth, was a totally different thing because it was like commissioned to do the piece for them, but it was like you were, I wasn't allowed to watch the shows before everyone else was. So the, I think the shows aired on a Thursday or Friday night. Um, so I'd watch the show like everyone else would, but I'd be sitting there with a notepad trying to take notes about the whole narrative of the piece because it wasn't just about the animals, but it was about the stories they were trying to tell with that. Uh, so I'd sit down, watch the program, and, f and it finished about 9 o'clock, and then I'd jump onto my computer and start sketching stuff out. And, and the, the work was submitted, I'd say that took about two hours, and it was, it was then put online the following morning. Um, so one of the things I learned in that period, even though I wanted to take time and have execution, it was like there, there was a way of drawing quickly and um, precisely that kind of gave birth to this style, which kind of has been like a through line 
through a lot of the pieces I've done. So this is kind of really like what originates that, the palette, um, the use of strokes, which are quite, I guess, quite graphical and quite kind of rem reminiscent of comic book illustration. Um, that's kind of really was the birthplace. It was a case of doing, having execution, but having speed at the same time in what you're producing. Um, so this is towards the end of the year. And one of the things in my work I hadn't really dealt with that much was likenesses. It's, it's always great having a piece and being able to draw, okay, I'm doing a full body. And my excuse was always I wanted to draw a character and never the actor. Because I always wanted people to see like, the story within a piece and not necessarily Tom Cruise's head. Um, but this piece for um, um, Ghost in the Shell, it was like, okay, I'm not, I, let's, let's, let's try and own that and let's try and create a piece which has likeness in it. So this was, I had a background in doing um, airbrushing work after university, so I was like, let's try and learn and, and lean upon that skills that I learned during that period. Um, so this is, like, this is built up of lots of layers of airbrushing. So you have a, a, f a blank canvas and you, you fill it through full with your mid-tone. So that's the most prominent color that's going to be prominent there. And then you, you add light, light, light layers and dark layers on top of that to build up tone and texture. Um, so I was really pleased with the piece. And you still see levels of brush strokes within that, but it's like we're creating this very smooth aesthetic, which I think worked really well for the film because we're looking at, um, we're looking at inorganic m material and so on. So very proud of that piece, but it's kind of like a benchmark for where I was that year, just to prove to myself and other people that I can actually draw a likeness when needed. 2017, 2017, so 2017 was what, probably one of my busiest years. Um, I was working full time and I was getting promoted at work, so doing well there, but then I was, I was getting more and more commissions from studios that year. So it was, it was probably the, 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 the most fulfilling year I had from a work point of view. And it's probably, probably one of my lowest points from a personal point of view because I worked every hour, got sent. I, uh, there was rarely a weekend I have ever, ever had off. And from having a family, it was like, is daddy going to be working this weekend? Am I going to get to see daddy? And it was like, okay, I needed a bit more work balance in this year. So there's a lot of great projects I worked on this year, but it's like, it's, it's quite poignant to me because it's like trying to find that work-life balance was, was a hard thing that year. So these, these are the pieces I created at the beginning of that year. And one of the things like you can see with the um, Born in China piece, which was a documentary for the Disney Channel, um, you can see the through lines from my Planet Earth piece. It, it comes from that same place of using stroke work and using tone and texture and just creating like, even like on the panda, you see every little stroke on his face and on, uh, all over his body. Each one of those hairs is hand drawn. But it was just taking that th thing a, a level further and spending a bit more time with it, but keeping that style intact, which is something that's, you know, I've carried on doing and I really like that style of just, you know, create like ink work. Um, and then if you look at the um, Cars 3 piece, it was like this year was like the year I picked up 3D modeling. Um, so a lot of times when you're working with studios, you get given assets and it's the same assets you generally see on the main posters. And that's great, but after a while, you're seeing the same stills again and again reproduced in everyone's work. So I wanted my work to be a little bit different from that. So it's like, what can we do? I can get someone pose for me, which is great. And some scenarios that works, but in certain scenarios, like I'm not gonna get a Ferrari to pose for me. I'm not gonna get the right car. I can't get the right angles to photograph myself. So I l started learning 3D modeling to create the bases of my pieces. So I'll use a 3D bit of software. I created the, the main image of the car and, and the wing mirror in that as a basis, just so I can get the right angle. And then from that, I started sketching on top of that and drawing like I normally would. But it gives you a great reference and it's like, references, you know, they, 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 have, they, have, they, they form the basis of most people's art. Whether you're drawing a portrait of someone or you're drawing a car, if you haven't seen it in the first place, you don't know what it looks like. Um, so you should never be shy of using references or telling people where your references come from. It's just a very honest way of, of talking about your work. So carrying on, it's like these are another two pieces I made this year. So the first piece was for Kingsman. And I'll, I'll say to anyone, drawing liquid is the hardest, hardest thing in the world. Um, but it comes from the same basis as what I did with my Ghost and Shell piece. It's still using airbrushing techniques. So if, if you're familiar with Photoshop, if you draw a marquee around something and create a shape, but then use your airbrush to fill that in. But use that with strokes. Use that um, using transparency and use multiple layers. To like see if you see the, um, the whiskey in that, that's created multiple, multiple layers of different types of browns that kind of break it up from the lightest back layer to the darkest tones to the mid tones. And you just create these shapes 
and then you use your eraser tool to, to take away from that shape, just so you have those soft edges. You don't always want a very crisp edge. You want that liquid to kind of flow in certain areas. Um, and then the, the characters that are, 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 are dancing on top of those glasses, like those are used 3D modeling to create the basis of those characters because I was never going to get someone to pose for me in that manner. Um, with that sort of energy. So the basis of those two characters are, are 3D mock-ups, which are then I've used as a basis to then draw. Um, and then the next piece is, is my Wonder Woman piece, which at the time was is definitely the, the biggest piece I've done, in a sense, from people recognising it. Um, and it, it, it's, it's still based pretty much on the style that I learnt during that Planet Earth 2 piece. It's still using a lot of the same tones. It's still using the same methodology of, of drawing and using the, that stroke work. Um, but once again, it's like when you look at your work, it's like it needs to come from uh, you know, an interesting place. So I did my research into um, um, Greek myth and Greek history and Greek art um, and picking up that, the idea of telling a story through a piece of pottery and how to break that fourth wall and breaking out of that sort of, that sort of storytelling motion. And I thought during when that piece came out, it's the most interesting piece because I had so many uh, museums and p um, history lecturers follow, follow me just because they really appreciated that work and how accurate it was to, to art history. So I was like, that was like a, a pat on the back for me because like I've done my research and it shows to the right people. Um, so that, that, that was that part of the year. So that was a very interesting year for me. And it's like, you know, I loved what I did there. Um, and it was the, my busiest period. But once again, like I said, it was my hardest year as well. Balancing so much work from, from, my, career, from my day job and, and you know, my, my, my side career was the hardest thing ever. And it was, it was at this point when I thought, okay, I can't do this any longer. I can't neglect, one, my health as well, and I can't neglect my family to this degree. So just before the end of the year, I, I quit my day job. And it's partly due to the basis of the success of that Wonder Woman piece that allowed me to, to quit my day job and have a level of um, structure in my work and a level of security in what I was doing that I was like, okay, let's give this a go. Let's go all in or nothing. And worst case scenario, if it doesn't work out, I've still got an education. I've still got a career that I had. I can dip back into that. So it was like, you know, there's, there's, there's a level of risk, but it's, you know, it's, it's calculated risk at any one time. Um, so that, so, yeah. So going through to 2018. 2018, the first year, I'm, I'm full-time I'm full -time illustrator. Quit the day job, not, not playing around with websites anymore. And I'm like, solely I'm going to illustrate and, and create movie posters. Um, so this is the work I've, I've produced in, in 2018. And what, what this year allowed me to do more than anything else was, which I hadn't been able to do, I guess, in 2018, was play around with stuff outside of briefs. I mean, the thing that I enjoyed most of all when starting this career was being able to see a movie trailer, feel inspired, and just create a poster for the fun of it. Um, between juggling two jobs, there wasn't any time for that. I would either have to do like project work or you know, if I had an idea, I'd put it on the back burner, but I'd never have time to execute on it. So this year allowed me to have that time, to have that stuff, to play around and try new ideas and try and, you know, try and do something different. So uh, the piece for Red Sparrow, Final Cut, that was my first um, graphic novel cover. And it, the, the reason why I got to do that was because I had time to pitch for the project and actually write an entire brief to the studio and say, I'd love to do this for this film. And said, great, let's, let's do that. Rather than just a brief coming to me, I, I got to write my own brief. Um, playing around Pride Mary, as you see, is like, it's the two kind of like um, polar opposites of the styles I'm kind of working with. One's very like crisp and smooth and using these thick pen lines. And the other one is using you know, like softer strokes and, and, and gradients and using this, this textured brush that I love using to only create depth and this organic feel. Um, and th this, this is a piece for um, Bohemian Rhapsody, which I did for fun, to be honest. And I did it one morning as my, like, my morning warm-up, and, and I did it in about, about two to three hours. But it, it's, it uses one brush to create the entire piece. I, I drew the whole thing in white originally, um, and it's just different opacities of my, still my same airbrush, the, the, the regular brush that you get in Photoshop, and just using that, and then using my eraser tool to take away shapes and create these like where there's sharper tones and where there's softer tones, but just basically using two brushes, using an airbrush and using an eraser, and then just multiplying that images and, and uh, adding these tones. And it's like that piece, like you know, it got you know once again people recognize it and the studios loved it, but I wouldn't have had a chance to do that piece unless I was working for myself, unless I was like put everything into having this career as an illustrator. 
So I really appreciate that piece, and it's like I've just, I was so surprised when that film came out that no one was picking up on the music video. It's so iconic in what it is, but they never used that in any of the original marketing. So I was like, it's crazy. So really love that piece. Um, and then towards the end of last year, I got to do this piece for Creed 2. Um, and once again, it's, it's, it's working with likenesses, but what I like doing it, it's kind of like pseudo-realism. I want it to look realistic, but I don't want it to look too, so realistic that it looks like a photograph. Um, but a lot of the things that I've done within the piece, they, they, they started off back, you know, 2013, like every single hair drawn on, on Victor's beard and his hair, each one is done by hand. So I've gone in and created a stroke for each sort of one and, you know, changing from light to dark tones. It's still that same process is there. It's just that I've got a lot more time and I'm a lot better at doing that now and it kind of shows in the work. So this towards the end of last year, these are the last two pieces I created in 2018. One was for Saga magazine and it was to do with their Christmas ghost stories. Um, and it's like editorial art is really fun because it's generally like a fast turnaround um, project. Um, but I thought it's, the last, it's one of the last pieces of the year. Why don't I like, take a bit more extra time and ha create something I'm really proud of and just creating, you know, it's using airbrushing tools, but it's also using the same things I did before. I, I created a shape of the piano beforehand and I started using that as my basis and my silhouette to draw on top of. Um, and then creating the keys and stuff. And I was like, I was sharing the, the, the image originally with um, the group that of like, you know, of friends that I have that who are also fellow artists. Like, there were certain like things that I had to fix. There was like the um, the floorboards to do with the bench that the guy sitting on. The angles were slightly skewed off. So fixing those it was also fixing the piano keys because I, I was drawing from memory rather than an actual piano. So like, make sure the keys are in the right place because someone who plays a piano is going to notice that straight away. So you're like whenever you create a piece, do the, you know, do the research that you need to, to have it you know, as close to real life as possible. Um, and then Empire Magazine. Empire Magazine was like, I set myself like, I hope in 2019 I get to do an Empire Magazine cover. And right towards, I think it was the last two weeks of December, I got the call from Empire, I said, Could you like, would you like to do January's cover? I thought, amazing, and, you know, it's for your having a bucket list thing and having it come straight away. Um, so that was another great one. It's like, once again, but it's using, it's using a different brush straight. It's still just a normal standard brush, but it's like just creating the, this energy within that. And it's like, it's, it's really like the two type of styles that I really like playing around with it. With. But, so that's where, that, that's been my journey in a sense from an execution point of view. So you can see my early work, it's pretty much all vector based and it's very much blocks of color and, and aspects of tone and how that's come over the years from actually having the confidence to use strokes and use painting and being self-taught and just looking and being aware of everything around me and just putting in the time and the effort to try and learn from the ground up. Um, but it's like, you know, when we ever like an artist shares anything on Facebook or on their portfolio, you always see the great side of things. You know, you see the success story, you see the works in progress. What you generally don't see is like the stories and, and, and the, you know, the, the near misses that go with that. Um, so one of the things I was talk about is like dealing with rejection as an illustrator, as a designer. It's part and parcel of the job and it's like, um, it's one of the things I try, try not to dwell on because if you, you allow yourself to go down that rabbit hole, it's quite self-destructive. Um, if, you get, if you don't get a brief or if one of your pieces get rejected, you, you know, because generally you're putting your heart and your soul and your work, you take it very personally. But the thing that I found always helps is just moving on to the next project as soon as possible because that excitement of working on something new always outweighs the rejection of you know, something you didn't get. So these two pieces which I, I showed earlier on, um, the first piece for Kingsman, I got commissioned to do five pieces for that movie in the same vein as what that is. They're all they're quite abstract pieces that kind of revolve around the word. And at the time I was like, great, I'm gonna do five pieces for Kingsman. So I did all five pieces, which I had two weeks to do. Um, and I was really happy with them. They went to the director and they got full sign off. Um, and then right at the, the, at the final point where the film was about to come out, they said, okay, we don't know how to use these, so we're gonna shelf them. I thought, okay, because I was like, I spent two weeks working on these, I wanted to show these off. Um, and, and they've pretty much gathered dust ever since then. There was one, at one point talk, a talk of, of it being u released internationally for when the DVD was coming out, but they never got used. So and I, as um, contracts go, you're not allowed to share your work unless your studio shares it. And there's, a, there's a generally a strict deadlines of when they can do that. But now that it's been a couple of years, I'm happy sharing it in this environment. But it's like, you put so much time and effort into something and you can't even tell anyone about it and you can't even share your work and you, you, feel, you take it very personally. Also because it's like the first time I was like playing with 3D as well. So it's those sort of things, those elements I was really proud of. And I never got to show anyone until like today. 
Um, so that was a real, you know, a kick in the teeth. Um, and then, yeah, this, this piece for um, Assassin's Creed, once again, similar story is like, for this piece, I learned how to paint with this piece. It was the first time I, I painted in that style. Um, so even though I look back at it now, it's like, okay, I could, I, do the, I could do that a bit better. But at the time, it was the best piece I had produced, um, being super proud of it. And once again, it got shelved because they said, okay, we love you and everything else, but could you make it brighter? Could you, you know, have brighter colors and tone? I go, well, that's not the brief that you sent me originally. You wanted these tones. You wanted this Renaissance style painting. And like me throwing loads of blues and loads of reds on it doesn't make sense at this point. They go, okay. But I, I still went ahead and I did a few iterations of it. And I think I was about three to four iterations down the line. And they said, okay, this isn't really working for us. Here's what we were going to pay you originally anyway. Here's the money I got, great but we're not going to end up using it anywhere. And once again, it's, it's that, it, that's probably the hardest thing. The hardest thing is not, not getting a brief or not getting the projects, but it's producing the work and it never being seen. Because you've got that in your backlog and it's like, what do you do with this? It's gathered dust for years and it's like, you move on from your work in style and, and in how good you are at anything. And it's like, after a few years, it's like, that doesn't you know, adequately represent who you are. But at the time, it was everything to you. So what do you do with that work? You know, I mean, one of the things what you're somewhat allowed to do now is when something is so old, you can say, hey, this is something I worked on as a concept for a film. And you can talk about it after the fact. And that's great from that point of view, from an anecdote point of view. Um, and you at least get something out of it. But at the time, it is quite a low point for you. And it's like hard to move on from that. But I would say to anyone, like, there's the rejection, whether you're, you're a designer or a writer or with any job, it's, it's part and parcel of what you do. And I would just say is like, find a way to, you know, pull away from that, whatever it is, whether it's like going out, you know, getting some fresh air, you know, finding a new project, whether it's just a passion project, you know, you, you will get out of that. It's not going to be, you know, what defines you by any means. So this is this, um, so the next part of, 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 of this um, presentation is about, something Jack asked me to um, talk about and, it, I, and I found it, it's a hard one to talk about because it's hard not to sound douchey when you talk about it. Uh, so I've put it in inverted commas for a reason. So it's like going viral. Like when, you're, when your work does really well and everyone's talking about it and everyone's sharing it, it's a great feeling. Um, I've had it a couple of times. Like last year I had it with this Deadpool piece. Um, and I did, the, I, mean, I did the piece and it took me a few hours. I mean, what I really like about it is the idea. The idea is the, you know, the, the important thing here and so it's paramount. Um, but you know, Hugh Jackman shared it and then in turn Ryan Reynolds shared it because they always got this to and fro. And because of that, like my phone went crazy over a 24 hour period. Um, from every bit of social media to people asking questions about it, everyone was like, I had to put my phone down and just turn on notifications because the battery was dying and I just couldn't keep up with everything. Um, but like the whole thing about going viral, it's a great feeling, but I still put my phone down and started doing the washing up the next minute. I, you know, you, I don't think you should let those things go to your head. I mean, the reason why we produce art is not for work to go viral um, or, you know, have that, you know, that sort of like glow that you get from it, but it's just like people like your work, that's great. But the thing that I took from that is the amount of interactions that I had with people during that, you know, 24 hour week period the amount of new art directors that had seen my work and connected with me because of that, that's what I took out of it. You know, make the most of those opportunities that you have when people see your work. Um, I, took the, I, I spent the next couple of days um, replying to everyone that left a comment on that piece on Instagram because they took, they took the time to, to either like or leave a comment on my work or ask anything about it. So I should now take the time to reply back to them. It's the only decent thing to do. And every, um, every art director that liked or followed me because of that, I followed that up afterwards. I made the most of the opportunity that I had. It wasn't about you know, walking around and thinking, hey, I'm everything now. You no, know, it's just I've given me an opportunity, let's make the most of it. Um, so the thing with like, any one of your pieces that kind of like steps over the line and does something great, just look at the opportunities that brings, brings along. Don't look at the piece and think you're great. Just look at the opportunities and what you can do with that opportunity that you have. Um, so one of the things going forward, like Jack asked me, how do I see my work going forward over the next couple of years and everything else? I go, from an ideas point of view, I still want to be doing work that's based on a concept that has a strong narrative and I don't think that's ever going to change. But from, from a learning point of view, like what I'm, I'm doing a lot more work with 3D, I'm using different programs just to elevate and like expand what I can do. Uh, because drawing and illustration is, is just a vis visual language. And you're trying to tell a story and the better you get, the, 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 the greater your voc vocabulary is with that. So you can tell a more nuanced story, a more detailed story. It's still the same story, but you can just tell it in a lot more richer detail. 
So that's what I want to carry on doing. So it's, it's, it's basically like, I'm going to draw something I couldn't draw yesterday. That's really is the aim every time I sit down. It's like, let's try and push myself, whether it's 10% or 50%. Let's try and create something new that I'm proud of every time. So each time I, I, I put a piece of work out there on the internet or on my portfolio, I'm, I'm always proud of it. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Thanks so much for coming, guys.